Hello, I'm Manuela Saragossa. Welcome to Business Daily from the BBC. Coming up, futuristic fashion. It's certainly going to be different. There's an Italian company in the north of Italy using milk protein to make fabric, which is very soft, as you can imagine. It's this desire to say, we can make anything out of anything. And why we might well be chucking out some of our old staples. A kilo of cotton takes about the amount of water you drink in your lifetime to grow the cotton. That's and that's before you even, yeah, that's before you process it. That's all here in Business Daily from the BBC. What you wear and how you wear it matters to the environment. Growing cotton, for example, uses huge amounts of water and land. Many other textiles are made from polluting petrochemicals. In fact, the United Nations says that the fashion industry is responsible for 20% of the world's wastewater and 10% of global carbon emissions. So just how environmentally damaging are some of our most worn fabrics? I asked someone who studied this long before it became fashionable. So my name is Dr Richard Blackburn and I am an Associate Professor and Head of the Sustainable Materials Research Group at the University of Leeds. The most common fabric that we use, well the two most common fabrics we use are cotton and polyester. Cotton, although it's natural, is probably the most environmentally damaging fibre that we have. It's terribly unsustainable based on terrific use of water, pesticides, fertilisers, grown in places in the world where there's massive clearing of land to grow cotton. And its impact is devastating on communities in terms of where it's grown. And just in terms of water usage, how, how much water does it take to make one pair of jeans? Just to grow the cotton, about a kilo of cotton, which, I don't know, depending upon your size, maybe two, three pairs of jeans, and I'm sure most people have two or three pairs of jeans in their wardrobe, but a kilo of cotton takes about the amount of water you drink in your lifetime to grow the cotton. That's and that's before you even, yeah, that's before you process it, bleach it, dye it, and then, of course, the water that you use during washing and things like that. Okay, I think a lot of people will be feeling really guilty hearing that. I mean... <laughs> Organic cotton, is that any better? No, no, not at all. Organic cotton is heralded often as kind of solving the world's problems, and it's absolute nonsense in my opinion. It just cannot be grown on the level that it would be required. It takes more land to grow for one thing. We already use too much land to grow cotton. So if you're going to use even more land to grow organic cotton, how on earth do we grow food for people to eat? And you think and there's the more am- land involved because it's organic, therefore you need it's- more land to produce the same amount, basically? Yeah, yeah, because it's not as productive. And also it's, it's still a very thirsty crop. It requires incredible irrigation. Yes, it doesn't use pesticides, well, certainly synthetic pesticides and certain fertilisers. So, yes, that is beneficial. But if you look at a full life cycle approach, I think it's just as bad as regular cotton and could potentially be even worse. And that's often what is missed by retailers. They focus so much on what something's made out of and they don't think about that full life cycle approach of everything to get to that product. And polyester? Polyester. Ultimately, polyester comes from a petrochemical source, so it's a plastic fibre. So it's got a significant carbon footprint. It has. There are moves towards recycled polyester, taking plastic bottles, converting those into fibre, but that is still only a very small fraction of the total polyester we use. Most of it still comes directly from oil. And even recycled polyester at the moment has its downsides because of the energy requirement to do the recycling and and the quality of the fibre that you produce in recycling. So that also has its issues. What do you mean by the quality of the fibre? Is it just not long lasting? So Well, what happens is every time you do mechanical recycling, which is becoming increasingly popular, you lose strength in the fibre. It loses that strength. So you go from a plastic bottle to a fibre, you can do that because the strength of the plastic in that plastic bottle, that water bottle, is higher than you need for a fibre. So when you recycle once, that's okay because the compromise in in terms of losing strength is still suitable, fit for purpose in a textile. But then if you then take that textile and recycle again, every time you recycle, you're degrading it a bit more and more. Richard Blackburn shedding a new and not-so-flattering light on our wardrobes. We'll come back to him in just a moment.
The good news is there are alternative textiles being developed which aren't as environmentally damaging. Leather made from mushrooms or bags made from banana leaves. Elizabeth Hotson sent this report, starting at London Fashion Week. London Fashion Week is known for its avant-garde visions of the next big thing. And at the most recent instalment held in a vast space in the centre of the city, I asked some front row fashionistas what kind of fabric innovations they'd spotted. We went to Premier Vision Paris and we saw a lot of leathers which were made from some leaves. Would you buy that kind of thing? I do own a Stella McCartney bag, but it's made of banana leaf and recycled plastic from the sea. Is sustainability and using alternative fabric something that you're interested in? Definitely, like anything that can be made out of fruit or natural materials is really important. And Samantha Conti, London Bureau Chief for Fashion Industry Bible, Women's Wear Daily, says that the trend isn't just limited to plant-based textiles. There's an Italian company in the north of Italy using milk protein to make fabric, which is very soft, as you can imagine. It's this desire on a small level now, but it'll get bigger, but this desire to say, we can make anything out of anything. In a small town called Soest, around an hour away from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Aniela Hoffing runs Neffa, which describes itself as growing the future of fashion. One of its most ambitious projects is the development of Mycotex, a fabric created from mushrooms. Intrigued, I travel to meet Aniela in her lab. We've just walked in to, uh, into the lab and in front of me is a tray wobbling away and there's around 20 or 30 foil-covered bottles sort of wibbling and, and wobbling. What's yeah. happening? We are growing mycelium in them and make a textile out of it later on. Mycelium is the root of mushrooms. It's a network of threads growing under the surface. So, for example, if you go into the forest and you see a mushroom, you dig in the ground, that's where you find very fine white threads. And those are the threads that we're actually growing here. You're, in effect, growing clothes from mushrooms. Yes. Well, what we say, we're growing the future of fashion. So how do you go from finding mushrooms in the forest to making, for example, a top? How does that process work? The mushrooms that we are working with are not the ones from the forest. We actually take cultured ones. There are some companies that grow this, um, but I can show you. So just going into the fridge now, which is full of all sorts of weird looking bottles and... uh, You've taken out a foil wrapped container, which looks like it's filled with uh, Petri dishes. So what's happening here? Yeah, so what we have here is actually how we grow mycelium. So normally you start with a little piece in the center of it and mycelium grows exponential so it doubles every day and then you get this really lovely white fluffy uh, material which for me resembles already the velvet of textiles and also the mushroom that we're working with looks like a pleated skirt but then a mini skirt and and for me those were already ideas that were interesting to use and create garments out of mushrooms. Is your background in fashion? Yes, my background is fashion and I've worked for different companies for 10 years. I didn't want to be a designer anymore because there was not really anything new and how many jackets can you design. So I started founding my company, Neffa, focusing on fashion innovation. So it sounds complicated and it's of course not that easy because we need to invent a lot of things. But at the end, it's a way shorter supply chain with a lot of environmental benefits as well. I'm really intrigued to see some of the clothes. Yeah, let's go upstairs to our studio and then I can show you some products that we've been working on. So here are some of the textiles. The first part of growing the material is done in the lab and then we go into our studio and this is where the garments are made. So we have different molds here and here for example this is a mold of a jacket where we uh, have put the mycelium pieces onto it. We're looking at fine tuning it a bit with a biodegradable coating. This looks incredibly delicate. I mean how practical is it? We are working hard on making the material stronger. So this is now for the catwalk ready. But yeah, of course, we want people to wear it for every day. And so this is where our current focus is. 
this jacket in front of us it's a little short sleeve kind of bolero style this is the prototype in effect the catwalk version how much would that cost if someone saw that on the catwalk and thought you know what i absolutely love that at the moment, this would be around 2,000 euros. It's a laboratory piece, so more an art piece. It's one of a kind. But of course, our goal is to have these in the shop for an affordable price. How far away are you from me being able to go into a high street store and buying a T-shirt made out of mycelium? Yeah, so the goal is for us to start with accessories. Our aim is between two and three years to have a uh, first accessory on the market. Then we continue with garments and, and shoes. But will clothes made from mushrooms or milk protein ever really be high street staples? Samantha Conti from Women's Wear Daily is optimistic. Absolutely. Zara, for example, has set some incredibly ambitious sustainability goals. They're looking to be zero waste, zero landfill, carbon neutral, and they're getting there. Everything will eventually be natural, biodegradable fibers. It's something that does cut across the luxury industry and also the high street. Elizabeth Hotson reporting there. Clearly, alternative textiles that are kinder to the environment have a way to go before they're available, to go mainstream and even affordable. So what should be we, we be wearing and avoiding in the meantime? Back to Dr Richard Blackburn, who we heard from earlier. In terms of cellulose-based fibres, so fibres similar to cotton in terms of doing what cotton does, I'm a very big champion of Lyocell. Um, which sometimes come, is under the branded name Tencel. There are also what is other. It? So basically, Lyocell is made from trees, um, specifically eucalyptus trees. The eucalyptus trees that they use for Lyocell are mainly grown in renewable managed forests in South Africa. Um, and they convert the wood pulp, which is similar, it starts similar to a paper making process. You make wood pulp, but then you take the wood pulp, you dissolve it and then form it into a fiber. Because as you'll appreciate, the, the wood pulp that you get out of a tree is not a, a usable fiber for a textile. But we can all, by dissolving it and reforming it into a fiber, it, 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 we can convert it into a fiber and a yarn and a textile. Um, and if you look at the environmental impact of that whole lyocell process in terms of of growing the trees and everything it goes through to get to the final fabric it's m massively beneficial from an environmental perspective compared to cotton so so for example the amount of water it uses about five percent of the water that cotton uses for the equivalent mass as you say it comes from trees it would involve growing huge amounts of trees to replace all the cotton that's around in the world wouldn't you, wouldn't you end up with the same problem? Like there well, are all no, these massive trees being planted everywhere, taking over land that, you know... Well, the, the reason why, that's a, that, why it's a, a great opportunity is because you grow something like eucalyptus, it grows incredibly rapidly, it grows in dense forests, you can grow it in many more areas of the world than you can grow cotton, because cotton's a tropical plant, it needs a very specific environment to grow. You don't need to use pesticides and fertilisers to grow the trees. They've got deep tap roots, so you don't need to irrigate them you know so you're already into an agriculture that's much more sustainable to grow and you can potentially grow it on land that you wouldn't use for growing arable crops so you're not actually competing with land for food whereas cotton absolutely does i think polyester is the answer i think it is a great fiber in terms of its performance we just need to think about how we utilize what we've already got because there's already enough polyester in the world to fulfill our purposes of using it for forever so we should be looking to use that rather than making more from oil Hold on to your polyester tops then. That was Dr Richard Blackburn. None of these new and wonderful textiles will ever get off the ground without the backing of the financial community. New ideas need investment and investors need to reward those fashion and textile companies that take a risk and innovate. But is that happening? Kate Elliott is Senior Ethical Researcher at Rathbone's Green Investment Bank here in the UK. 
I think it's fair to say that as an investment community, when we're looking at uh, the clothing and apparel industry, the environmental impacts of it are perhaps a more emerging issue. So you can look at alternative textiles, so things that have got a lower life cycle footprint, and some of the innovative technologies. So whether that be kind of using digital printing in the dyeing techniques, as opposed to the incredibly water and energy intensive standard practices. But As with anything, we need this to be applicable at a mass scale. This can't just be something that is only going to be the preserve of the middle classes or only a niche area of the market. And the man on the street will think the investment community, people who invest in these kind of companies, Mm -hmm. they don't really care. They're just doing it because they're worried about there being financial repercussions if these companies don't meet certain targets. Mm -hmm. But do you find that the interest in these companies meeting environmental criteria, that that it's genuine? (laughs) I think it's the level of commitment, it will vary by company. So there will be some that are absolutely doing it because they see it as the right thing to do. And there will be others that are doing it because they recognise the benefits that some of these approaches can have on their bottom line. And ultimately, from my perspective, it doesn't really matter because the end result is the same. The end result is reduced environmental impact, it's better labour rights in the supply chain, and it's better outcomes for people and planet. But are there financial consequences, do you think, long term for retail companies, clothing companies that don't adhere to sustainability? So one of the key things that I'm looking at when I'm reviewing companies is, are they scanning the future horizon for any likely changes in regulation? Or are they just sticking to business as usual, meeting the the minimum requirements of today? And if it's the latter, then those are the companies that are likely to be caught out if public opinion changes suddenly, as we've seen that it can do with reactions to disposable plastic, for instance or if government regulations change. Is it possible that ultimately this will all lead to cheaper, more efficient products on the market? Absolutely. I mean, you see it with any area of innovation where when a technology is really new, it's obviously quite expensive because it's operating at a small scale. There's all the kind of research and development costs that have gone into it. But then as it moves to a larger scale, you get efficiencies of scale and that product will drop in price. I was speaking there to Kate Elliott at Rathbone's Green Investment Bank uh, here in the UK. She ends this edition of Business Daily. But while we're on the subject of environment, there's a news item on the BBC business page about a survey by the Swiss bank UBS. It found that travellers are beginning to turn their backs on air travel over concern for the environment. One in five people had cut the number of flights they took over the last year because of the impact on the climate. That's it from Business Daily. We're back again at the same time tomorrow. Join us then. I'm Kim Chakanetsa, and I'm the host of The Conversation podcast from the BBC World Service. Oh boy, I'm overwhelmed with so much to say in such a short time. Some recent favourites include an episode on female roadies, these two incredible women who've just been touring the world of musicians and had some incredible stories to tell. This is a live show and sometimes things go wrong and tonight something's gone wrong. (laughs) I also found the episode on women living with schizophrenia incredibly powerful. She does not believe that there's such a thing as a mental illness. She still thinks that perhaps it was her demonic possession that happened to me. Another episode was about women who were standing up to street harassment. I'm sick of it. It's in front of my house. It's in my street. It's near my train station. It's all the time. And I've always had female flight attendants on my wish list. And we finally got to speak to two women who had spent a lot of time up in the air. People just stormed the door because they had to get off the plane. They were so scared. That's the conversation from the BBC. World Service. You can't put price tag on these emotions. Search for the conversation wherever you found this podcast.